We're back at the Red Hat Summit 2022, the Cube's continuous coverage. This is day one. We're here all day tomorrow as well. My name is Dave Vellante. I'm here with Paul Gillen. Matt Hicks is here. He's Executive Vice President of Products and Technologies at Red Hat. Matt, good to see you. Thanks for coming on. Nice to see you face to face. Thanks, thanks Dave. Thanks Paul. It's uh, good to be here. So you took a different tack with your uh, keynote today. You had an homage to Ada Lovelace and Srinivasa Ramanujan, which mm -hmm. was kind of cool. And your, your point was, they weren't noted at mm -hmm. their time, and nobody was there to build on their early ideas. I mean, Ada Lovelace, I think it was a century before, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> Ramanujan was a you know, decade plus, but, and uh, you tied that to open source. So give us your kind of bumper sticker of your premise there. Yeah, you know, I think I have a unique seat in this from Red Hat where we see, we see new engineers that come in that sort of compete on a world stage in open source, and the the best, which is easy to track just in contributions, are not necessarily from the background you would expect them from. And, and it, for me, is always really inspiring. Like you have this potential in, in people and open source is a great model for getting that out. We told the history story because I think when you look over history, just some of that potential that's been ignored before, um, sure it's happening right now, but getting that tied into open source models we think can hopefully let us tap into a little more than, than we have in the past, so. Seriously, so when you're thinking about innovation and sp specific to open source, is it a case where, I wonder, if I don't really know the history here of open source, maybe you can educate me. Is it the case where open source observes uh, a de facto standard, let's say, or some other proprietary approach and says, hey, we can build that in open, and that's sort of the, the inspiration, or is it, an innovation flywheel that just invents? I think it's both at this stage. So in the, in the early days, if you take something like Linux, it was a little more of, you know, there was the famous memo of like, this is going to be a hobbyist project. We're just going to light up x86 hardware and have an operating system we can work with. That was a little more of like the standards were there, but it was can we just build a better operating system with it? Be yeah. Better than Unix, because Unix it would live up to the promise of Unix. That's right. We're, and yeah. Unix, you had some standardization of models, but it wasn't open in that same sense. Uh, Linux has gone well beyond a hobbyist project at this point, uh, but that was maybe that clone model um, to Unix. These days, though, if you take something like Kubernetes or take something like Ansible. That's just more pure innovation. You didn't necessarily have a Kubernetes model that you're building a better version of. It was distributed computing and how can we really make that tick and uh, bring a lot of great minds into that to build it. And so I think you see both of them, which is it's one of the things that makes open source fun. Like it, it has a broad reach at this point. Mm -hmm. There's one major area of software that open source has not penetrated yet, and that is applications. I mean, we mm -hmm. there have been you know, Sugar CRM, there have been uh, open ERP applications and, and such, but none of them really taken off, and in fact have tended to be drawn back to being proprietary. Why do you suppose open source has been limited to infrastructure and has, hasn't branched out further? Yeah, I think part of it is uh, where can you find a, a model where lots of different companies are, are comfortable contributing into? If you have one solution and one domain from one company, you're going to struggle more getting a real vibrant community built around that. When you pick an area like infrastructure or core platforms, you have a lot of hardware providers. The use cases span from traditional apps to AI. You have a lot of places to run that. It's a massive company. So it's volume, really. It, it really is. You just have an interest that spans beyond companies, and that's where we've seen open source projects really pick up and build critical mass. How about crypto? Yeah. Hmm. DAOs, I mean, that's, right? Isn't that the, the form of open source? I mean, isn't, isn't yeah, that the no, application? That's it, it really what, exactly what you're talking yeah. about. It, yeah. I, it's true or? Yeah, well, if you look at cryptography, encryption algorithms, even go to um, quantum going forward, I think a lot of quantum access will be driven in an open source model. The machines themselves uh, will be machines, but things like Kizkit, uh, that is how most people will access that. So it is a powerful model for getting into areas that are um, pretty bleeding edge on it as well. We, so, were talking, go ahead, go ahead. Please, uh, we were talking before, Andy mentioned that hardware and software are increasingly intersecting. That was a theme we heard at the, at the keynote this morning. Yep. Why do you believe that's happening and how do you see that, how does that affect what you do? Uh, you know, I th 
I think the reason that's happening is there is a push to make decisions closer and closer to users on it because uh, on one side, like law of physics, and then on the other, of it's just a better experience for it. And so whether that is in transportation or it's in telecommunications, you see this push outside of data centers to be able to get at that data locally for it. Uh, but if that's the draw, I think also we're seeing hardware architectures are changing. There are um, standards like ARM that are lower power that lets you run pretty powerful compute at the edge as well. And I think it's that combination saying we can do a lot at the edge now, and that actually benefits us building user experiences in a lot of different domains is, is making this pull to the edge uh, really quickly. But it's, it's, a, it's an exciting time to be seeing that happening. And, and, and pretty powerful is almost an understatement when you yeah. think about what the innovations that are going on, right? I mean, in, 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 in particular at the edge, mm -hmm. I mean, you're seeing Moore's Law be blown, everybody says Moore's Law is dead, but you're seeing the performance of when you combine the GPU and the CPU and the NPU and the et cetera, I mean, it blows yeah. away anything we've historically known. Yeah. So you think about the innovations in software that occurred as a result of Moore's Law, what are the new beachheads that we could potentially see in you open know, source? I think when you start taking the um, AI patterns on this, and AI is a broad space, but if you go even to like machine learning, of optimization type use cases. You start uh, leveraging how you're going to train those models, which gets you into you know, CPUs and GPUs and TPUs in that world. And then you also have the, how am I going to take that trained model, put it on a really lightweight device, and efficiently ask that model questions. And that gets you into a different architecture design. Uh, but that combination, I think we're going to see these domains build differently, where you have mass compute training type capabilities, and then push that as close to the user as you can to make decisions that are more dynamic than traditional code. So, so. a lot of the AI that's done today is modeling that's done in the cloud. Yep. And what you're talking about at the edge, and you think about you know, vehicles, is real-time inferencing. Yep. And yeah. that's, that's massive amounts of data. It's a, a, different architecture, right, mm -hmm. and, and requires different hardware, presumably, and different yep. software. So, yeah. and you guys, well, Linux is obviously there. Yeah, right? that's, that is the, where we get excited about things like the GM announcement. You are in the square in that um, aspect of running compute right at the end user, and actually dealing with sensor and data that's changing there to help, you know, in this case, like driver's assistance capabilities with it, but I think that the innovation we'll see in that space will be limitless on it. So it's it's a nice combination of the two, and you'll still have traditional applications that are going to use those models. I think of it almost as it's like the new middleware. You know, we have our traditional middleware techniques that we know and patterns. Um, they will actually be augmented with things like uh, machine learning models and those capabilities to just be more dynamic. So it's a fun time right now seeing that. A lot of data. Too, uh, and I, I, again, I wonder how much of that is even going to be persisted. Pro probably enough, because there's going to be so much of it. How much will come back to the cloud? A lot, but maybe not most of it. But it's still massive amounts relative to what we've seen before. It is, and this is you know you've heard our announcement around OpenShift streams and those capabilities. And Red Hat, what we do, we will always focus on hybrid with it because a lot of that data, it'll be dropped at the edge because you won't need it but the data you act on and the data you need, you will probably need at your end device and in your cloud and maybe even on premise and capabilities like Kafka and the ability to pick and stream and stay consistent. We think there's a set of really exciting services to be able to enable that class of development and we're, um, hopefully we'll be at the center of, of that. You, you announced uh, today an agreement with GM uh, to, to build on their Altify platform. Uh, auto industry, very proprietary historically mm -hmm. uh, with, the, with their technology. Do you think that this is an opportunity to crank that open? Uh, absolutely, I think in, I've been involved with open source for a, for a while, but I think all of them started in a very proprietary model. And then you get to a tipping point where open source models can just unlock more innovation than proprietary models, and you see them tip and flip. And I think in the automotive industry and actually in a lot of other industries, 
the capabilities of being able to combine hardware and software fast with the latest capabilities, it'll drive more innovation than just sticking to proprietary models. So, yeah, I believe it will be one of many things uh, to come there. You've been involved in open source for a while, like how long of a while? People must joke about when they look at you, Matt, they must say, well, did you start when you were five? No, yeah, <laughs> it's uh, You get that a lot? <laughs> I, I do. Uh, it's uh, my, my children, I think, aged me a bit. But, uh, but yeah, for me, it was the mid-90s. That's when I started with, uh, with open source. So, it was, uh, wow. so it's been a long, long you, run. You made the statement in your keynote that software development is, is, is messy. I presumably part of your job is to make it less messy. But yeah. now we talk about all this, these new beachheads, this new, new uh, innovations. A lot of it's unknown, yeah, and it could yeah. be really messy. So, who are the? Who, is there a new breed of developer that's emerging? Are they going to come over from the cloud developers, or is it the, is it the IoT crowd and the, and the OT crowd that's going to be the new developers? I, I wish I knew, but I, I would say I think you, I do think you'll get to almost like a laws of physics type challenge where you won't learn everything. You're not going to know. Uh, the depths of 5G implementation and Kubernetes and Linux on that. And so for us, this is where mm. ecosystem providers are really, really critical, where you have to know your intersection points, but you also have to partner really well to actually drive innovation in some of these spaces because uh, the domains themselves are massive on it. So our area is we're going to know hybrid, we're going to know, you know open source based platforms to enable hybrid, and then we're going to partner with companies that know their domains and industries really well to bring solutions to customers. So. I'm curious about partnering, uh, because Paul Courtney mentioned that as well as, as being critical. Do you have sort of a template for partnering, or is, is each partnership unique? Um, I think at this point, uh, the market's changing so fast that uh, we do have templates of uh, who are you going to embed solutions with, who are you going to co-sell with and co-create. Uh, the challenge in technology, though, is it shifts so quickly. If you go back five years, maybe even 10 years, public cloud probably wasn't as dominant um, as it is now. Now we're starting to see the uptick of edge solutions probably being having as much draw as public cloud. And so I think for us, the partnership follows the innovation on those curves and finding the right model where that works for customers is the key thing for us. But I wish there was more of a pattern. We could say it stays stable for decades, but I think it changes with the market on as we do that. But you know, it's funny because you, 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 you see every 15 years or so, the industry gets disrupted. I mean, we mm -hmm. certainly saw it with mainframes and PCs and then the internet and then the cloud. Uh, you guys have kind of been there, well, Linux, throughout. I yep. mean, it, it, okay, it built the, built the internet, it built the cloud, it's building the edge, so it's almost, I don't want to say you're disruption proof, because that's just that's going to jinx you, but, <laughs> but, in, but you've architected the products in a way that they're compatible with these new eras mm -hmm. of industry. Everything needs an operating system. Everything needs an operating system, but you've seen operating systems come and go. You know, and, and, so, and Linux has survived so many different waves. H why, how? You know, I, I think for us, when you see open source projects, they definitely get to a critical mass where you have so much contribution, so much innovation there that they're going to be able to follow the trends pretty well. If you look at a Linux, whatever the next hardware innovation that comes out is, Linux has enough gravity that um, it's open, it's successful, you're going to design to it, the capability will be there. I think you're seeing similar things in Kubernetes now, where mm. if you're going to try to drive application innovation, it is a model that gives you a ton of reach, you have thousands of contributors. That's been our model though, is find those projects, be influential in them, be able to drive value in life cycles, but I think it's that open source model that gives us the durability where it can keep changing and tracking to new patterns. So. Yeah, well, there's been a lot of open source that wasn't able to sustain, so I, you guys obviously have, have a magic formula. That's right? true, we, there's, uh, there is some art to picking. I think millions of projects, uh, but you've got to watch yeah, for that Open source mass. is also a place, place where failed products go to die. Yeah. So you have to be sure you're not, you're not in that corner. Yep. Well, look at Kubernetes. I mean, the fact that that actually happened is, is it's astounding to me when you think about it. I mean, even Red Hat was ready to 
go in a different path. What if that had happened? Who knows? Maybe it never yeah. would have. Maybe to your point about Ava Lovelace, maybe it would have taken a decade to, or it Robin Ugin. You know, I think in some of these you have to you have to watch really closely. We obviously have a lot of signals of what will make good long-term health, and I I don't think everyone looks at those the same. We look at them from trademark controls and how foundations are structured and um, who the contributors are and the spread of that. And it's not perfect, but I think for us, you have to have those, that longevity built in there or you will have a spike of popularity that has the tendency to just um, fall apart on yeah. it. So we've conditions. been uh, yeah, doing that pretty well. Conditions so for a long life is something that's yeah. a, a, it's a, maybe it's an art form. I don't know if it's a data form. It's a <laughs> culture, maybe. Yeah. Maybe it's cultural. Yeah, probably a combination. Some days yeah. I think I'm like, this could part art, part science. Yeah. but. Uh, but it's certainly a fun space to be in and see that happen. It, um, yeah, it's inspiring to me. Yeah. Matt Hicks, great to have you back on theCUBE and uh, good job in the keynote. Really um, interesting angle that you took, so congratulations. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're very welcome. All right, keep it right there. Dave Vellante for Paul Gillen. Red Hat Summit 2022 from Boston. You're watching theCUBE.